my mantra is listen, listen some more. And when you finish listening, listen again. And then when you finish listening again, listen. And then listen some more. Don't stop listening. Thinking about the uh, the ISC and what it has meant to me, I'm reminded of this uh, proverb, which is um, uh, it goes Hiaha te me nui a iti a he tangata he tangata he tangata, and translated it says I ask myself a question: What is the most important thing in the world? It is people. It is people. It is people. And for me, that's what the society, its core essence, is the people involved with it. Well, I was at a meeting, I think in 1986, at the University of Florida. And that's where I met Daryl. And I found him to be, as all of us did, very engaging. He was different at a scientific conference than other people, of not just expressing interest in the paper, that was interesting what you said, but already that sense of, we've got to build something out of this, you know. We, we can take it from a conference where I get up and talk about this and you get up and talk about that to let's pull this together for some sort of action. I was introduced to him by Alejandro Argumedo and Daryl just looked at me. He didn't say hello, he didn't say nice to meet you, he didn't, none of the formalities, the conventionalities, he just sort of glared at me and said, what responsibilities are you going to take up? And <laughs> it took me aback, and then I found it extremely refreshing. And there have been, I think, for, I mean, for me, what keeps me coming back to the society and working for this society is the quality and the character of the, of the people we meet and the kinds of personal transformations that happen in person, face to face at the congresses and, um, you know, after the meetings. I didn't attend the, the first Congress in 1988, but from what I know of Daryl and, and my discussions with him and others, um, Daryl's work in the Amazon brought him into contact with particularly the Kaiapu people who he worked with and for, for, I think he lived with them for 14 months and became to speak their language fluently and to learn their customs and traditions. But more importantly, um, Daryl came to understand the struggle that these people had in preserving their natural environment from degradation, from damming, from logging, and um, from people, scientists, researchers, academics coming in and studying the knowledge of these people. And Daryl, to some extent, was doing that himself, but he wanted to do something to um, better recognize and protect um, those people and their traditions. But there was a, a feeling on Daryl's part that, you know, ethnobiology had a, had a major role to play, and that uh, it had to be an international presence. It couldn't simply be local, national groups of uh, folks who cared about these kinds of issues. He thought we ought to form an international society of ethnobiology, and we did. One of the things that you get to appreciate in uh, the society is how you deal with other people, especially the indigenous people, the local societies that, uh, that tend to be disadvantaged in a number of ways. And of course, I remember the beginning of the uh, 
the whole development of the society is that there was this outcry of the local communities, the indigenous peoples being robbed, as it were, of their resources, of their knowledge, without being acknowledged, uh, w without even, you know, he thought about as if they own something. And these are the concerns that we've continued dealing with in the society. Darrell was challenging the orthodoxy. He was challenging the um, researchers and scientists to look beyond what they were doing as um, an academic exercise and see that they're working with real human beings, that unless we actually protect the cultures and the language and the traditions underlying those communities, then what they were studying was not really worth it. Because we can't just preserve biological diversity without preserving the cultures that sustain and maintain that biological diversity. So we can't just preserve biological diversity without preserving the cultures that sustain and maintain that biological diversity. So this is what really attracted me to Daryl. He was championing that. He was a champion of cultures that sustain and maintain that biological diversity. When we were doing the Kunming Action Plan, there were a few things that impressed me that, you know, kept on coming back. And of course, one of them was recognizing uh, indigenous knowledge as inventive and to be used in um, conservation and research programs. And it's lucky that this came at a time when the uh, governments were negotiating for the Convention on Biological Diversity. And Dario and other people really worked so hard to see that these elements were put in and they ended up in Article 8J uh, about access, and benefit sharing, uh, respecting. All these terms I remember the negotiations had to enter into the convention because of uh, a few people that insisted that this must be in. The concept of ethical space is a part of the RIC Code of Ethics, and that uh, is a very rich concept for me. It was actually brought into the context of research relationships by a Cree scholar and philosopher named Willie Ermine. The way that Willie talks about ethical space is a common space, common space of reflection and retreat and negotiation, discussion, a place for uh, two entities or more than one entity to come together and um, not to merge, to uh, be autonomous, to respect each other's autonomy, each other's worldviews, each other's way of doing things, but to come to this common space and be willing to listen and understand the other, uh, to be willing to find the place of commonality where um, you can move forward together, maintaining your distinction but moving forward in a productive way, in a respectful way, in a, in a way that is mutually agreeable. Well, with outsiders, like, you know, or with anybody else for that matter, like, you know, working with plants, everybody has their own way of doing things. What my elders told me, like, you know, that there's no real wrong way of doing things. We have different ways. So we need to understand that. So, like, I mean, if you have a different way of, of learning, 
like you know about the plants, that's okay. Um, I estimate that we have a moral, ethical uh, responsibility not to to choose for them. That's the main message I would say, and that's the a fundamental message uh, from IFP. I think is to. Um, uh, advocate that people should choice, should choose by themselves what what they want the future to be. But we have a responsibility to inform them about the trade-offs and to inform them about the long-term consequences of the um, current choices. The indigenous perspective is critical in today's world when we are dealing with environmental issues at the broadest level, diversity in, in all levels as well, uh, whether it be cultural, bio, biological, um, in every aspect of life. It, 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 we have to take that holistic perspective because, again, we're getting back to Western science and compartmentalizing things into a little bit here, a little bit there. What I don't want to see is the indigenous perspective become a token perspective. It, it has to be much more interactive. At uh, every Congress I think there needs to be this ethical space that we talk about created for um, uh, greater participation of Indigenous peoples, not just by participation I don't just mean Indigenous people coming to Congresses and observing academics presenting papers about the research they've done on Indigenous peoples, but actually um, academics and researchers and scientists and whatever, ethnobiologists, put, you know, taking themselves out of that uh, forum of academia and going into the Indigenous community and experiencing things firsthand from the point of view and worldview of Indigenous people. In my culture, we don't look at ourselves as human beings as being mutually exclusive of animals, birds, water, trees, plants, other organisms, um, fire, air, earth, uh, all of the elements. Uh, it's, it's much more intimate, emotional, physical, mentally connected. Um, the, the, the spiritual aspect of, well, all of those elements, the, the mental, the physical, the emotional, and the spiritual, are critical to our way of being uh, and, and critical to the relationship that we have with other living beings, organisms, entities, whatever the case may be. You know, my, my elders told me, like, you know, we can ask our ancestors for help. And you know, what is what do we do? Like, you know, what is what I do? Like, when, when we start first thing in the morning, ask the ancestors for help, for guidance, for direction. So, like, you know, we have that, I mean, we are connected to the past. Because the ancestors have the knowledge and experience of the things that have happened. And as far as the future, the things that we do now will affect our future generations. So we got to be careful, like, you know, about what we do. Like, you know, what what our ancestors did mm -hmm. when they went out and cut a tree they did it with honor with respect and uh, they understood the cycle of life the key objective of the society is to um, defend the earth's biological and cultural diversity. You can't defend something unless you know what it is you're defending. 
and if indigenous peoples are integral to the maintenance of biological diversity then it behoves uh, academics to better understand the perspective um, from an indigenous viewpoint um, and and that's that's not necessarily them uh, agreeing with it but to understand it is really important um, and as our elder Levi Martin at this retreat has, has told us you know it takes patience um, you've got to listen and not just listen but hear uh, and you can't necessarily do that by sitting in a conference getting PowerPoint presentations or papers shoved at you time and time again but going out and, and actually doing on the ground experience with these people from an indigenous perspective it's the hands-on practical experience of doing something as opposed to just reading about it that's important mm -hmm. There's a saying in, in um, New Zealand or amongst Māori, a face seen is an argument understood. So you've actually got to, to have direct engagement. Like, when we look around, like everything out here is in what we call an ally. They're there to, like, you know, help us. Like, th that's what our that's what our ancestors did, like, you know, when they were learning about the traditional medicines that they used. They would go and talk to a plant, and if they didn't get their answer, then they'd take it home, and they'd talk to it every day, ask it, like, you know, what have you got to offer me? What messages would you like to share with me? You know? Sometimes it took quite a while. To get, to get the message to hear. I met uh, the society first in 2000 when I was uh, in Georgia, and I thought. Uh, well, I thought at that time the society was one of the different ethno-bio societies or ethno-something society. And I was touched immediately by the kind of, um, of really personal attachments many members had. And also my feeling was, uh, at that time, I am in a kind of very strange and weird society. One side of my person was keeping saying, of course, this is not a very serious scientific society. But the other side was saying, uh, that is cool. So in the year then afterwards, I have learned that this society is, um, is very special. It's very special because, at least for me, it could be also for others, uh, was able to reconciliate my professional life with my deep uh, personal level things, insights. So there was a kind of harmony between what I was doing since a uh, few times in terms of research and what also my aspirations, my dreams uh, as human beings were. Well, the society itself, it looks like once you get into it, maybe you don't get out because it sort of uh, pulls you. There are so many things going on that touch on your uh, convictions about life, as it were, that you just keep on uh, going. But the real interesting story of this society was and probably is that there is a mixture of different levels of different things. Sometimes this mixture is chaotic, sometimes it's very spontaneous, is not properly canalized, organized in, in specific frames, but that 
uh, adds at the end of the day also some pepper and some charm. Mm -hmm. A warning for anyone who wants to be a part of this really amazing, unique hybrid collective is that I think you need to be prepared to be transformed. <laughs>